Kings to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 6. My message is entitled, The People God Uses. This will be a two-part message. I'll give you the next part when I come off a of vacation. I thought I was going to do the whole thing today, but I figured I'd philosophize a little bit. The people God uses. Judges chapter 6. We're going to read verses 11 through 16. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Judges chapter 6, beginning with verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the, an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained to Joash, the Abizarite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites and also the Amalekites, so if you read the book. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? It's kind of a rebuke there, a little reproof that he was given to Gideon. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. If you were in Gideon's shoes when he said that, you'd have said, This is utterly impossible. But God says, I am with thee. Amen? All righty. The people God judges. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we stand in thy presence, I pray, Lord, as I preach and proclaim the word of God, that you would take it and minister to thy people. Father, the greatest privilege we have is being able to serve thee, to be called by thee, chosen by thee, and then to serve thee, Father. And then, through your grace, you even reward us in eternity for our service that we do for thee down here. Father, I pray you bring all things to my remembrance, <clears throat> strengthen my flesh, and I pray you to anoint the word of the living God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, in verse 32, the heroes all of faith and fame chapter, we're told that Gideon was considered to be one of the great champions, one of the great heroes of the faith. Now, beloved, he was considered a real valiant and gallant hero by both God and Israel. And yet the most impressive thing about Gideon was that he was not impressive. And I'm not saying that to be an oxymoron, but that's just the simple truth. The most impressive thing about Gideon was that he himself was not impressive. In other words, he was not from an aristocratic family, but from one of the poorest families in Israel. In fact, beloved, he was a herder. He was a farmer and the youngest son of Joash and the line of Manasseh, which was a very weak tribe. He wasn't a professional soldier. In other words, he wasn't trained in the military arts and tactics and strategy, but he was a young man who planted crops and, and uh, tended flocks. And he wasn't, a prof uh, excuse me, he wasn't this big, great, muscular, Herculean type of man that you would think you would choose to lead an army. But rather, through the testimony of his own lips in verse 15, he said that I am the least in my father's house. I'm a nobody is basically what he was saying. In the vernacular of today, beloved, that's what we would truly say, that he was a nobody. He was really nothing special. But you know, God has a way of working through nobodies, doesn't he? And God has a, a way of making somebody who's a nobody really something that is extraordinary. Many times, beloved, we see people rise to the occasion, and you'd think, this is the least person that I would ever expect to do such a heroic work like this. And yet they do. They step up to the plate. Amen? So he wasn't impressive in his size or his looks. He wasn't impressive in his stature. Certainly wasn't impressive in his education or his training. Yet God used this ordinary man to do extraordinary things. Beloved, I want you to take this with you today, that God takes the nobodies and makes them into somebody. Now, I told you, Satan's always beating us over the head and telling us we'll never amount to much. We're nothing before the Lord. But, beloved, why in the world would God bankrupt heaven, empty heaven of its greatest treasure to save mankind, fallen sinful mankind, if we weren't something in his sight? 
Man is the crowning work of God's creation. God breathed into man the breath of life, his own spirit. He breathed into man. Would you say amen out there? So God called and he used Gideon as a judge to deliver Israel from the attacks and domination of their avowed enemies, namely the Amalekites and the Midianites. It was so bad that the children of Israel had to go up into the mountains, plant their crops, and then camouflage their crops to hide them from the marauding uh, Amalekites and Midianites who would come and steal their food. Now, this wasn't like you could go down to a stop and shop or market basket, somebody stole your food and get another grocery bag. This was an agrarian society. You lived off of what you grew. And by the way, I think we all had to start learning how to plant gardens because I really think there's going to be food shortages. But the, what I'm saying is this here is that these Amalekites had total reign of the, over the children of Israel, stealing all of their food. But God says, I'm going to call you, Gideon, to defeat them. And consequently, as a judge, he became one of Israel's mightiest military, spiritual, and political leaders. And as a result, beloved, the Bible tells us that he, Israel was richly blessed with 40 years of peace and prosperity under the judgeship and reign and rule of Gideon. Now, can you imagine, beloved, all these other nations are more powerful than you, but God had come upon Gideon, who was a nobody, who was very reluctant in what he was going to do. And yet all of the other enemies that surrounded them, God made them stay their hand. Listen to me, God used to do that for America. But right now, beloved, not only because of what's happening with the secular people, but in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so remember... 1 Peter 4, 17 says, Judgment first begins at the house of God, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the wicked appear? Scarcely be saved. That ought to make your knees knock. So, beloved, we're all familiar with the story of Gideon, how the angel of the Lord came upon Gideon, called Gideon to a master, an army to defeat and destroy the Amalekite army. Now, the Amalekite army that was arrayed against them was 135,000 uh, soldiers, and they mustered to attack Israel's little army, and the most they could muster was 32,000. But God had Gideon reduce his small army to an even smaller army. God says, 32,000 is too many. I want 300. Why, Lord? Because I'm going to prove to you that when you defeat the Amalekites and the Midianites, it wasn't your army that did it. It was your Lord that did it. Would you say amen? It was your God working in you, with you, and through you. And so God wanted to, them to know there wasn't their military proudness. And we need to understand that, beloved. And I'm not against education. I've got some myself. But a lot of times we think it's our own intellect. If I'm only smart enough, I've only, it's not, beloved. It's whether or not you will avail yourself to God and do what he tells you to do. Become his vehicle and vessel and let him work in you, with you, through you. So, beloved, as the story unfolds, we see that even though the Amalekites and the Midianites outnumbered Gideon's little band of men, and they outnumbered them by some 450 to 1. I'll tell you something right now. If you were a betting man, those are terrible odds, amen? I wouldn't want to take that bet. Nevertheless, God still gave the victory to Gideon and his small band of 300 men, uh, dedicated men. Listen to me. One man that is filled with the Holy Ghost, that's filled with the courage of God, he can change the spirits of all the people around him. I saw it happen when I was in the military. Just when you thought you were going to be overrun, one guy stood up and then emboldened everybody else to stand up and fight. And so these 300 men, can you imagine, beloved, looking at 135,000 dead carcasses laying there, and the 300 men hadn't even lifted their hand yet. Because God got them to have mutiny among themselves. And they started killing one another. So, beloved, God gave Gideon the victory in that, his small 300-man army. Now, principally speaking, this, show, this story shows us that God can do much with very little. That God can make somebodies out of nobodies. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that God uses the foolish and the base and the weak things of the world to confound the things that are strong and that are wise and that are mighty so that no flesh would ever glory in God's presence. Amen? 
Take a look at the apostles, beloved. They stood before the Sanhedrin. These men were scholars. You understand that? Scholars of the Word of God. And yet they recognized that these untrained men had been with Jesus. Because God had now gotten a hold of their mind, their soul, their spirit, and he downloaded his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding into them. And they were just sitting there almost like robots, articulating, pronunciating all these different things that were coming out of their mouths. And it astounded all of these learned men on the Sanhedrin. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to let you know because we have a tendency to see all of our own frailties sometimes, but we fail to see the supernaturalness and the omnipotence and the almightiness of the God that's working in us. Amen? In verse 31 of 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1, beloved, Paul concludes by saying this, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You want to glory in something? Don't glory about your education or I'm a hero, I did this. God says you want to glory about something, glory in the Lord who loved you, saved you, uses you, puts his spirit upon you, puts his grace upon you, and gives you the opportunity to serve him. Would you say amen out there? I love when I read this story about Gideon and his 300-man army attacking that 135,000 army. It reminds me of the Battle of Thermopylae. You remember that when King Leonidas of Sparta led his 3,000 men to fight against a one million man army of the uh, Xerxes, the king of Persia. And beloved, they held these people off long. They bottlenecked them and they held them off long enough so Greece could really muster their armies. The problem is they were all killed, all 300 of them, right to a man. But imagine they, they were wise enough, brave enough, strong enough, they know that we can't fight them openly on the battlefield so we're going to catch them into the only pass that can go into Greece. They bottleneck them, put their uh, flanex up, their, their formation, and they held off this one million man army. And if you ever read about the Battle of I think there was a story on that on TV, wasn't there, about that? I don't know. But the, 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 there were some special forces within the Persian army at that time. They were called the Immortals. And Leonidas said this. He took out his sword. He went... We're going to see just how immortal they are. <laughs> and they had them stacked up like cordwood. The book says that they took the dead carcasses of every charge and they built a wall that was 20 feet high of dead Persian soldiers. Can you imagine that? And I won't go into the whole thing and tell you about their navy, what they had against the uh, Persian navy, but all that to say, beloved, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 7, he says, For who maketh thee to differ one from another? And what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? In other words, every gift, every talent you have, every opportunity to serve the Lord, it came from God directly. He is the one that gave it to you. But we're waiting for a voice from heaven to say, I'm using you now, Joel. I, really, that's what we think, beloved, because we are so stuck on the horizontal and see everything through our tactile senses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it tells us this, that the Holy Spirit imparts spiritual gifts to every believer when they get saved, but then he adds this, to profit with all, meaning that God gives this Holy Spirit, his spiritual gifts to individual believers, not for the benefit of themselves, so they can call attention to themselves like many uh, sadly or regrettably do in the Pentecostal and charismatic movement when they're always stand up speaking in tongues like they're out of control. But that's not of the Lord at all. But I'll tell you this. God equips his people. And whether you know it or not, God will work through you just like a vessel, like a funnel. And that power will be channeled right through you. I was doing something uh, about a week ago, and I said, Lord, I cannot lift this, but I had to lift it. I had to do something in my yard. And my back wasn't so good, but I crouched down, I got close to it, hugged it, and I said, Lord, give me the strength of Samson. And you know, I lifted that baby up, and I mean, it was 10,970. <laughs> nah, I'm only kidding, it was only 7,000 pounds. But anyways, I lifted it up, 
and I was able to move it. I kind of strutted like this here, and I took it, and I put it where it needed to go, and God uh, protected my back. Amen. What I'm saying to you, beloved, is God gives every believer supernatural gift to mutually benefit the whole corporate body of Christ or the church so it can run and function properly and sufficiently in an orderly fashion and bring glory to him. Every one of you sitting here today has been given at least one spiritual gift, a minimum of one. Some of you might have five, four, whatever it may be. And it's to benefit the, all the people around us, not just so you can get some glory. It's to benefit all the people that are around you. Yet many never exercise their spiritual gift. And consequently, they deprive that area, that aspect of the church body, its much-needed service and ministry to operate effectively. And as a result, ladies and gentlemen, this terribly grieves the Holy Spirit because it was Him who sovereignly and specifically gifted each and every uh, Christian with the exact and necessary gift he foreknows that is expressly needed right there in that local church that he has placed them in so they can worship, so they can serve, and so they can grow. Would you say amen? Every Christian should belong to a local church. Beloved, I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor of this church. That's exactly what the Word of God teaches. The Bible does not teach independent Christians running around doing their own thing. If a person doesn't want to come to the house of God, which is the bride building a body of Christ, well, I want to tell you something right now. He's a backslider. He's disobeying the word of God. And God says you need to be in the house of God. I want you where I can use you to serve the people that I put in that local assembly. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, uh, what bothers me, however, is sadly and frightfully many, as Jesus taught in the parable of the ta talents, actually bury and fail to use their spiritual gifts and talents, and in the upcoming reckoning on the day of judgment, they will be called and considered an unprofitable servant, sad to say, and Jesus said they'd be cast out of his kingdom where they would be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Beloved, if you've been called to preach, I feel like Paul when I was called to preach. If I didn't preach, I was afraid God was going to do something to me because I knew he had called me to preach. I mean, I knew it from the moment I got saved. Now, believe it or not, I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like standing in front of people. I am, I'm basically a loner, <laughs> okay? But I had to get over myself and let God do what God was going to do. Now, I could preach just as happily if we put a big curtain right here at the end of the pulpit and I wouldn't look at you. Because the, the point I'm getting at is because I believe that I'm doing God a service. And as long as you can hear my voice, and you're probably going to hear my voice longer than you see me because I'm getting older. But the fact of the matter is, prayerfully, it's going to minister to you. And the CDs and the DVDs that have gone everywhere, believe me, everywhere throughout the world. I won't go any farther with that. But why is it, beloved, that so many believers don't use their spiritual gifts and talents God gave them to benefit his church? Well, there are numerous reasons, and I can't go into all of them, but let me give you some primary ones. Many believers secret away their spiritual gifts and talents. Why? Because they're not, they think they're not smart enough. They're not spiritual enough. Hey, listen, it's God's job to make you spiritual. All you've got to do is, when he's giving you the grace, have your heart keep pointing that way. Amen? Why, beloved? Because many think that they're not gifted or talented enough or they're not ready or trained enough. I said to a woman uh, uh, last week, I, I was giving the gospel to this woman, and I said, you need to be baptized now. And this person said, I was baptized. I says, when? When you were a child? They said, yeah. I said, that's invalid. And I ended up saying things to this person who did not want to hear but I was loving and I was kind because I recognized <clears throat> if she walked out of this office without doing something, I may never see her again. And I wanted to make sure on the day of judgment she knew exactly how to get right with God. Would you say amen out there? She prayed with me, but I told this person that they need to be baptized. And so, beloved, a lot of people think they're not trained enough. Listen to me, your training will come later. There's other lazy. They're sloths. You see, it costs to serve the Lord. 
Beloved, I was thinking just this week, all my interruptions get interrupted. I'm trying to prepare a message. <laughs> and it costs you to stop what you're doing and get your mind back focused on what you want to say on that message. And then somebody calls you, somebody writes, Pastor, can you contact and send a, this out to my uh, boss or to my attorney? Beloved, your mind's going in and out, in and out, in and out. But yet it comes with the territory. I'm not complaining, believe me. But what I'm saying to you is a lot of people are just lazy. Listen, fooey, I've had it. Let them fend for themselves. Let them do their own thing. They got themselves into that mess. Let them get themselves out of it. That's what a lot of people say. You see, but a lot of people that hide their gifts, they want all the benefits, blessings, and bounties of the church. <clears throat> they want all the freebies of the church. They want all the help in ministering of the church. They certainly want all of the knowledge and the wisdom and the teaching that they can get from the church and whatever else they can get and learn from the church. But they don't want to participate in the church. They don't want to contribute to the church. They don't want to help out in the church. They don't want to get involved in the church. You see, beloved, people who hide their gifts like this are takers and they are not givers. And that's an awful place to be in, isn't it? I, I wrote someone yesterday about that very thing. This person said something to me, and I said, what is it? How have you served the Lord? You're always seeing what you can get from the church, what you can get from the church. I said, what is your ministry at church? What have you done? Who is it you're ministering to? Well, you know, click. But it's amazing, isn't it? People always complaining, but they don't want to do anything to change anything. You see, beloved, folks like this, they want to be taught, but they don't want to teach. They want to serve, be served, but they don't want to serve. They want to be ministered to, but they don't want to minister. They want to be helped, but they don't want to help out. They want to be sure their children are being taught in Sabbath school and junior church, but they don't want to be involved in those ministries. They want to be able to leave their babies off in the ministry, into the crying ministry. <laughs> but they don't want to take care of the babies in the uh, nursery. And they want to be listeners of the music and of the choir, but they don't want to serve and sing in the choir. And you know, beloved, if you've got a gift that you should sing, sing! Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen? And they want to be comfortable and have a clean church but they don't want to have to be discomforted or bothered to get to work cleaning up the church, and on and on it goes ad infinitum. It's amazing how many things people take for granted. They think that what we do is just open the doors and everything takes care of itself. Boom! Now, I wish that were true, <laughs> okay? Believe me. I wish that were true, but that is not true, Amen. You see, folks like this want all the benefits of the church without any of the burdens. And these are the exact type of people, the unprofitable servants, whereof Christ speaks, who bury and fail to use their spiritual gifts and talent to serve both him and his church, who are going to have a terrible and rude awakening on the day of judgment. And you know, beloved, as a pastor, sometimes it's like having the cure for cancer you know it will help that person, but they won't take the medicine. No, 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 no. Instead of trusting, could God be speaking through the man of God? Could God be speaking through a preacher? Good night. He says he's going to save the world through the foolishness of preaching. Hey, could he be speaking to you and you and you through this man right now? You see, beloved, these are the exact type of people, the unprofitable servants they are. And God doesn't want it. He wants to reward us on the day of judgment. They expect everyone else to do all the work in the church. Well, they just sit comfy and cozy and sop it all in and up. They're takers, not givers. They're selfish, not selfless. They're gifted, but they're not willing to use their gift for the benefit of others, beloved. All they do is warm the pew. All they do is watch the serving few. You know, the, it's a literal statistic in Christendom that 10% of the church, any church, does all of the work. 90% coast. 10% do the work. Isn't that amazing? And that's a statistic. You can look it up. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying they love to take in the view. And yet the Bible says that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God's not going to revoke that gift uh, from you, but he's going to hold you accountable for it. Make sure you used it for his glory. Amen? 
So God knows the exact spiritual gifts and talents He's given to anyone, all of us, beloved, to profit with all, and someday we will all have to give an account what we did with our gift for His glory. I can't tell you over the years, time and time and time again, when my flesh was weak and my back was killing me and I was, I didn't think I had anything left in me. And I said, Lord, this is for your glory. This is for you. I'm doing it for you, Lord. And that it gave me the grace to persevere and get through it. Now, beloved, if Gideon didn't use his gifts and talents, he'd have never been called a mighty man of valor. He'd have never made it into the Heroes Hall of Fame and Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. God had called him, God had anointed him, but yet he had to make the choice as to whether or not he was going to go and do it. Amen? So how do we know what our gifts really are? That's a good question, isn't it? I'll tell you how, beloved. Now listen to me closely. You wait for a text from Michael the archangel. No, let me tell you how. God opens up the opportunity in that area of service where he needs you to serve, and then by his grace and providence, he enables, empowers, and equips you to do that job and places you right there at the right moment. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to do this or just pass the buck? That's how you find out what your gifts. Let me tell you how I found out my real calling for preaching. I was home on a Saturday night. It was 10 o'clock, 10.15, and I got a call from a pastor's wife and said, the pastor is in deep depression. Can you preach tomorrow? Now, I was already, that day on that Sunday, I was preaching Sunday school, and I was preaching Sunday night service. Now, at this time at night, I had a scramble, <laughs> okay? And uh, the Lord gave me what I needed to, needed to have, beloved, but I knew then there because I felt the words. I didn't have the time to prepare like I wanted to prepare, but God was working in me. I could hear his words speaking to my mind, loosening the strings of my tongue, and I felt his heavy hand of anointing that was upon me. So, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. It is not your ability that God's looking for. It is your availability, and I've told you that many, many times. Will you volunteer? This reveals the disposition of your heart to God when opportunity knocks, and you're either going to say yay to God or you're going to say nay to God. Not, you know what, I'll do it next week when I have a little bit more time or whatever. No, beloved, I told you, your interruptions are going to be interrupted when you serve God. It takes sacrifice to serve God. Would you say amen? Like the godly men and women of old, beloved, whom God called to serve them, we too, like them, need to pray, Here I am, Lord, thy servant hears thee, send me, use me. Isn't that what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6? Who shall I send, and who shall go preach these words? Here am I, Lord, send me. I know I'm a nobody, but I can be somebody when your hand's upon me. So, beloved, stop making flimsy excuses and get to work serving God while it is still day, because Jesus warns, the night cometh, I preached that sermon, the night cometh when no man can work. Work will you have the day, he says, for the night cometh when no man can work. Now, beloved, the story of Gideon is a graphic picture of just the type of people God uses to serve him. At first, when Gideon got the call, Gideon was very reluctant, but then God touched him. When God touched him, beloved, now he knew that he was ready. He didn't know how he knew he was ready, but he knew inside of him, like we do, when God touches us, that we're ready. Now, I've got five points, but I'm only going to give you one today. Number one, God uses, God uses mainly common people. Let me say that again. God uses mainly common people. What kind of people? Common people. I want you to look at Judges chapter 12, uh, 6, and look at verse number 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, beloved, I want you to drop down to verses 14 through 16. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. How can you not defeat the Midianites if I'm with you, Gideon? 
and thou shalt smite the Midian, Midianites as one man. Drop down to verses 33 and 34. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer, Abiezer that was his father, by the way, who was a Baal worshiper, but now he sees Gideon, this dynamo, he says, was gathered after him. Now, beloved, God didn't see Gideon as he was as a man in the flesh with his own natural inbred gifts and talents. How did God see Gideon? God saw Gideon as he should be, as he could be, and as he would be in the spirit. Would you say amen? Have you ever been with someone, I don't, if Christian or non-Christian, boy, that guy's got spirit. No, he's, there's something about him. Well, this is what happened with Gideon, beloved. That is, after he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, after the angel of the Lord would come upon him and impart to him the supernatural gifts and talents he needed to do this specific job, a mighty job, a battle-fighting, beloved, kind of a job that God had called him to do. You see, God foresees him as now being a mighty man of battle whom he had anointed and appointed. God knows there's nothing that can defeat his spirit because the Holy Spirit is a person and he's omnipotent. Would you say amen? You see, God foresaw him as being a, a brave deliverer of his oppressed people who he supernaturally empower with his Holy Spirit and the angel of the Lord. And God foresaw him now as being respected and a feared judge in Israel who personally closed with the divine presence and the authority of the Lord that was upon him. You see, folks, Gideon would be eminently qualified and competent to fulfill this service and ministry because God had called him to it. God had supernaturally enabled and empowered and equipped him with these divine spiritual gifts and talents to be able to do it. These are the things that Lord, the Lord loves to impart to men who uh, take that grace and not use it in vain. You see, folks, but... And don't you hate that when there's a but? But, even though God had called Gideon, anointed Gideon, appointed Gideon, empowered Gideon, but before Gideon could ever supernaturally be used by God, first he had to say yes to the God call of God, and so don't you and I. Not, Lord, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a nobody. I know that. But I can make somebody out of you, and I want to use you. Do you want to be used, Joel? Do you want to be used, Dave, or David, and, and Derek? Do you want to be used? See, that's how God works. God, I don't care if you've got a Ph.D. The Ph.D. you want is pray heaven down anyways, right? And God can work through you. I, I know more people who study the Bible by themselves and forgot more than most seminary or cemetery professors have learned. I mean, that's just a fact. You listen to me, beloved. The same is like why truth for us. When God chooses and he calls and he equips us to perform some ministry and service for him, he does not force us to do it against our will. He makes it plain what exactly it is that he wants you to do, but then he looks at your heart and he wants to see whether or not you're going to volunteer your services. Also, beloved, God doesn't see us as doing it naturally in the flesh and our own abilities. But now that we're in Christ, he sees us doing it supernaturally in the spirit. I've learned so many things as I've gone along. I said to a dear sister a few weeks ago, she said to me, what do I say? I says, you know enough, God will get a hold of your lips and he'll speak to you and with you through you. And then I got an email that day and saying, you're right, he did. <laughs> And so, beloved, you, you know, didn't Jesus say when they bring you up before kings and governors, take no thought what you're going to say, because it won't be you speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking what? To you, in you, with you, through you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to shelve your brains and sit, just walk around and say, I'll just wait for that. No, you do what you're supposed to do, amen? And God picks up the slack, and he makes sure that gift that you have is being used. You see, God, I told you, is not looking for your ability. You may not have much ability, beloved, but you do have availability, amen? 
That is, you have to be willing and volitional. Your disposition of your heart must respond with a resounding yes to his call to serve him whenever and wherever we're needed. He'll give us that ability so we can indeed do the job and we do not have to worry about it. If God has called you to do something, then God's going to make sure you're going to learn. You're going to be equipped to do it. Would you say amen? Just like Gideon was, ladies and gentlemen. See, God's not looking at your natural gifts and talents or your education as qualifiers and preconditions to be able to get the job done, but at whether or not we have a ready mind and a willing spirit to be able to serve him. You know, I've seen a lot of people over the years, they start off a ball of fire, and I see that ball just all cold, almost going out. Let somebody else serve. I've been here so long. I, 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 I've heard all the excuses. Hey, listen, the night cometh when no man can work. Amen? If you're going to make hay, you better make it while the sun's shining. If you're going to do something for the Lord, now's the time to do it. Amen? And, beloved, God is not looking at your age physically as either a person or your spirituality as a Christian because you have been served so many years in the Lord. I have seen more new Christians know more, more on fire, than many Christians who have been saved for 40 years, or 30 years, or 20 years. And don't you love the fire of a new Christian? It's that wildfire. It starts you on fire. It reminds you of what it was like when you first got saved, and you were on fire for the Lord. But we live in such a society today where everybody has to be entertained and it's me, 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 I, 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 and we're the center of our own universe, not God. I'm going to titillate my flesh. You know, Joel Osteen said, this is your best life now. That's what a lot of Christians believe. But he's a heretic and I assure you, don't believe him. You see, what God is looking for is a believer with a real servant's heart. Is that you? What God is looking for, ladies and gentlemen, is for a believer who is willing to suffer and sacrifice to do God's work just like Christ did for him on the cross. Is that you? What God is looking for is a believer that counts it a great honor and privilege to be called of God for his service and job above all others and have this entrusted to him as a laborer in his vineyard and given the capacity to do it. Is that you? Have you said, Lord, use me, whatever it is, the most menial job? You know, I wasn't always a pastor. I was a regular church member. I cleaned the toilets, and when I became a pastor, I cleaned the toilets for the first five years. Washed them, didn't clean the church down, vacuumed the rug all the time. In other words, beloved, I just looked at it, it had to be done, it had to be done, period. Amen. Someone's got to do it. But I'm sure God didn't miss that. So whatever you do, you do for the glory of God, whether in labor, deed, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, do all, of course, for the glory of God. So God uses uh, common people, beloved, extraordinary. He does extraordinary things. And I mean extraordinary things through ordinary type of people, common people like you and I. For example, God used common people like Noah. Noah was a simple farmer. But God called him and used him, and he became a preacher of righteousness, and then God used them to build this monstrous, monstrous, titanical ark in the middle of nowhere to save his family and a remnant of uh, uh, animals from the coming judgment of God who was going to flood this earth and kill all of humanity and all the rest of the animals. Now, can you imagine, Noah, a what? I, I, I don't know. I've never seen it really rain on the earth yet. And you're going to have it pour for 40 years? And you don't want me to build a, just a little rowboat what, 476 feet long, 75 feet beam, 75 feet high, you want me to build that? How did he do it? Who did he employ to do it? Where did he cut all the material? It wasn't like he called Home Depot and got the lumber yard to jump off the, drop off the lumber. That's why it took 120 years. And I was amazed when I read that story why that 
you know, you're getting finished with it, and all the rest of the wood has been sitting there for 120 years. It's rotted on you, so the front of the boat. <laughs> no, God took care of that. You see, what God was doing was calling Noah. God expelled the earth through one man, Adam. But now he was going to use Noah, and he was going to be the new Adam. And Noah was going to rebuild a new world. And he was going to preserve and perpetuate the human race so that the Christ, the Redeemer, could be born. That seed of the woman could finally come into the world right through the loins of Noah. God kept his promise alive. It's called the scarlet thread of redemption as you study it the, uh, theologically wise in the Bible. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God took a simple man like Noah, and he did extraordinary things, didn't he? A preacher of righteousness. How many people listened to him in that day? Even some members of his family didn't want to hear it. His sons-in-laws didn't even want to, oh, these guys are crazy. I'm not going to follow him out here. And they stayed right in Sodom, and they died with the Sodomites, didn't they? And by the way, that's what happens when people trust in the majority and not what God says. And that's why I told you in my, my um, message for the 4th of July that this country was not founded as a democracy. It was a democratic republic. It was one nation under God and constitutional law. Because whenever the majority comes to power and they vote, they always suppress the rights of the minority. Now, I'm not going to go there with that. But, 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 but I want you to think about this. God used common people like Abraham. Who was Abraham? Well, you say he was a great Jew. The Bible never calls him a Jew. Listen to me, beloved. Abraham was a nobody. He was a Gentile from Ur, the Chaldees. Imagine that, a Gentile. He was called a Hebrew when he crossed over the Euphrates River, the Euphrates River because that word means one who crosses over. It has nothing to be Jew. You don't find the word Jew mentioned until you get to the book of Ezra. And that's because it was, they were from the tribe of Judah. So it was called what? Jews for short. But anyways, beloved, he was a childless, 100-year-old man. But God called him the miraculously Cyrus' son from his loin in his dotage. And ultimately, that offspring multiplied. It became the godly nation of Israel, the number of whom the Bible says would be as the sand of the sea. From one man at 100 years of age, but God was working through him. Would you say amen? Who against hope believed in hope? I know I'm an old timer now, Lord, but bless you be God, you're going to do something with me. <laughs> and he did. I, I don't even want to tell you the story of him probably chasing Sarah around. Oh, you won't go get away from me. <laughs> God said you're going to bring a Messiah into the world. <laughs> Can't you just see that? You see, beloved, it was through his loins that the Messiah and the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately came. And God used a simple man like Moses. Moses, the first 40 of his life, he lived high off the hog in Pharaoh's court. But, but then he became a nomad for 40 years, amen? He goes through the desert, he becomes a nomad, a sheep herder. 80 years of age, he gets a call. God said, Moses said, you know I'm older now, right, Lord? I'm 80 years of old, Lord. That's just where I want you. Because now people will see it's not you doing it with your own strength, but it's me supernaturally and miraculously working in, with, and through you. Would you say amen out there? So Moses the nomad is called to lead and deliver the tiny nation of Israel that's in bondage down in Egypt away from that superpower of the known world. Now, you read that in the scriptures and you know the story. Put yourself in Moses' shoes. The children of Israel are in bondage. They don't have a standing army. This is the superpower of the world. It would be like the United States of America uh, with all of the military assets that we have going against, uh, say, Haiti. You say it's impossible. It is in the flesh, amen, but not in the spirit. And beloved, God uses common people like Joshua, the servant of Moses. He's just a servant, but he's a faithful servant. And when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. Who goes up with him? Joshua, the servant. And what happens, beloved? He becomes Israel's greatest general. 
and he led her untrained army to conquer and occupy the promised land of Canaan, totally defeating all of their trained and their armies combined. So Joshua, beloved, these people didn't have weapons. They got their weapons from the people that they killed with their sticks, with, their, with stones, and then they picked up their weapons. But when God's on your side, who can be again you? Right? If God is for you, who can be again you? <laughs> kind of sound like a cowboy. <laughs> How about Elijah, beloved? God uses a common person like Elijah, a man subject to like passions as we are. And God enabled him to fervently um, and effectually pray, Lord, the children of Israel don't want to listen to a word I have to say. Shut off the rain in Israel. And I want you to do it for three and one half years, Lord. And what happens? He does. He so moved God's heart. This man, beloved, didn't have much of a wardrobe like John the Baptist. Imagine he's eating wild honey and locusts on the Jordan River. What a diet, Amen. Probably healthier than what we're eating right now. But beloved, can you imagine? He prays, and the Bible says God shuts heaven down. No rain, no blessings. King Ahab and Jezebel are furious. Well, he's called the troubler of Israel. But after that confrontation with the prophets of Baal, beloved, what happens? The Bible says that he goes to him and Gehazi, his servant, go to the top of the mountain, and he's looking over the Mediterranean Sea. And he says to Gehazi, I'm going to pray for rain. You can see the smoke coming up right now. Gehazi, is it raining yet? No, master, not yet. He prayed seven times, and on the seventh time, the Bible says a fist came up out of the water, like a fist. And that cloud started mushrooming, a mushroom. And Elijah says, holy mackerel, good up your loins there, Ahab. And he runs 17 miles ahead of the chariots uh, into Samaria. Just a normal, ordinary man, beloved, doing extraordinary things because God's hand was upon them. When I think of the apostles, I've read their biographies as much as they, from extant writers. But, beloved, we know from the biblical account that some of them were fishermen. Fishermen. And they cursed and they cussed and you know the way fishermen would do. Some of them were tax, uh, uh, tax collectors. Some were craftsmen. Some were Pharisees. But in less than 30 years, the Bible said they had turned upside down the known uh, world with the gospel and changed the entire course of human history. Was God working through these 12 months? Beloved, picture. I, I want you to picture this. You're watching Christ ascend up into heaven. There's only 11 of you now. Judas has betrayed you. And he says, Go ye therefore into all the earth and preach the gospel to every creature. Into all the earth? I haven't been outside the city of Jerusalem. I haven't even been really into Samaria like I want to go yet, or on the other side into the Galilee. And you want me to go throughout all of the earth? Where am I going to get the money? How am I going to learn the languages? Where am I going to get the supplies? Who's going to protect me? God says, I am. Did God give them the money? Yes. Did God give them supernatural ability to speak in tongues and foreign languages? Yes. And they got the job done. 30 years, the Roman Empire, the known world at that time, was evangelized. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, God often uses common people to do many special and uncommon things for him. And God often uses common people to do many extraordinary and amazing things for him. And God uses common people to do some unusual and fantastic and incredible and phenomenal things for him. You see, God states that common people, that he supernaturally endows with his miraculous power, are able to do many things that will even baffle the intelligentsia. You know, it's amazing. Having been somewhat of a man of science, I've seen science change so much since I went to school because we're learning more, and that's what you do. You build on the generational knowledge of another, and you discard what's not going to work, amen? But God says, I don't care about how intelligent you are. You don't have to be intelligent. Stephen, they weren't able to, re uh, when Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin, the Bible says they weren't able to resist his words, resist his wisdom. God would plop a vignette of truth into his mind, and it would confound them, huh? Now, you, know, you know what? And they 
covering the microphone, you can see him. I mean, a notable miracle is done. Even we can't deny this one. <laughs> right? Even we can't deny this one because he's walking around now, and we've known him since his birth. And he's been disabled since his birth. You see, beloved, God says, Who maketh you to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now thou didst receive it. Why dost thou glory as if thou haven't received it? I'm the one who makes you differ from another. I'm the one who will give you the talent. I'm the one who will give you the call. I'm the one who will give you the power to do it. I'm the one. Look to me, all ye ends of the earth. I'm the one. You see, for the most part, well, let me just say this before I say this. I sound like John Kennedy. Oh, let me say this before I say that. I remember. It's a rare few that are gifted by God to be a genius in savants. I remember growing up, I had a, uh, a friend that was born, or neighbor, their son was born with Down syndrome. And they, they, in them days, it wasn't all of the uh, different type of services to help these kind of people. But you know, when he sat down on the piano, he heard a song one day, he just heard it, and he sat down and he played it on the piano. Never had taken a piano lesson in his life. And when he played it, it soothed him because he was hyper. And he was playing. So he was a savant when it came to music. God had equipped him, amen? God is the one that gave him that talent. And it's a rare few that gifted by God to be brilliant and intelligent or prodigies or sages, beloved. And it's a rare thing that God would profoundly use any of us at all, but he's chosen that's how he's going to do it. So I'm saying for the most part, God uses common people like you and I. For the most part, God uses ordinary and plain people like us. Regular people. Oddballs like you, not me. But oddballs like us all, beloved, to do his great and mighty works. Let me ask you a question. If the Lord were to come today, and he may, we don't know. If he were to come today, what kind of servile legacy would you leave behind as a Christian? Will it be said that you lived as a saint of the Lord? The people can say, you know, that person really is a Christian. They act it, they dress it, they live it, they talk like it, and they serve. Will it be said of you that you were servant of the Lord, beloved? That person said was always involved, whatever had to be done in the church. My father used to say to me, God bless his soul, son, if you want something done, give it to a man who is busy, not to a slothful man. A man who is busy finds time to make things get done. Amen? He's used to getting things done in his life. So find a busy man and look at him. Look what he's done. Look at his testimony. Well, beloved, will it be said of you that you live as a sloth, that you didn't use your gift and talents? And God says, you know, I want every one of you in the day of judgment to receive all of the crowns you possibly can. But in order to get those extraordinary gifts, then ordinary people like you and I, common people, need to get busy and get to work for the Lord. Amen? So my first point to you, and I'll pick up on this when I come off a of vacation, is that God uses common people. Now listen to me. I told you God's gifts are to profit themselves. Is that what it says in the Bible? What does it say? God's gifts are to profit with all. In other words, if you've got a gift, you ought to use it in the church to minister to your brothers and sisters. Would you say Amen. Not just so you can go and do your own thing, so to speak. The gifts of God are without repentance. The calling of God is without repentance. And God someday will say, I hope he'll say to me, Joel, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You use the gifts that I gave you. And I'll tell you all along, beloved, honestly, I'm not trying to be false here, I feel so inadequate. I say, who am I, Lord? Who, I'm, I'm a nobody. And I, I, I mean that. And it gives me courage because... If God can use me, he can use you. <laughs> right? Because most of you got more talents than I do. So that point number one, God uses common people. Will you let him use you? Let's go to the throne of grace.